See, now, now, now. <laughs> Holy crap! Holy crap! Technology. I'm exhausted already. I, I, I can't believe what I need just about happened. Two beef sandwiches. Before we begin, this is Daryl, Daryl Wilson, hey. Bull Weevil. We're at Johnny's Beef, the Johnny's legendary beef. Johnny's Beef. Legendary. Before I begin, I should mention Daryl. You ever notice the fees on your phone bill start to add up? State fees, federal fees, administrative fees, streaming surcharge. Not exactly what you signed up for. Maybe it's time for a switch. At Boost Mobile, your taxes and fees are included on all plans. That means the price they say is the price you pay. Sorry, Metro PCS. Switch happens. Boost makes it easy to switch. Switching makes it easy to save. Stop by a Boost Mobile store today. There it is. Now, because I'm recording the podcast at the same time as we're doing Facebook Live, this is where I'll drop in the theme song. It's Car Con Carne. And now here's the star of our show, James Van Okay, so hello Facebook Live. There's Daryl. We're at Johnny's, and uh, we're going to talk to Daryl about his career, his time in the bull weevils, his time in the punk rock scene, in the Chicago scene, his time practicing medicine, treating the ill, the the in need, the the the, the uh, injured, the injured, the infirmed, the uh, ingrates the involuntarily committed individuals. That's uh, right. All the because things. he is the punk rock doctor. Uh, we're also going to talk about the movie he appear, appears in this year. Uh, but first, we're going to eat messy beef sandwiches on camera. This yes. is what you came here for. Oh, yeah. This is going to be good. Now, combo sandwiches. Combos. I wish there was a way that people listening and people watching could oh. smell. The, the second you get out of the car here... Amazing. I, what did I say? There's an aphrodisiac. Yes. This, he almost made out with me. I almost did. so good. But I mean, because Daryl is eight feet tall, he was able to fight me off. I did. I, like, kung fu him right now. I was like, yeah! Okay, now, you got. we got the same thing. We got combos. Combos. You went hot. I went sweet. Right, I went hot. I think this is hot. Yep. Oh, that's yeah. That's a lot yeah. of jardinera. Oh, jardinera. And I grabbed a handful of napkins. I don't think it's enough. No, it's... And they really give totally bullshit yeah, napkins so those here. Yeah, small I mean, napkins. That's not gonna. Do they know really. what they serve here? Here. Oh, thanks. On your thigh. So yeah, I went sweet. Johnny's oh. Beef in Elmwood Park on North Avenue. It's just west of Harlem. This place is a treasure, They're and I best. swear to God, the prices haven't uh-huh. changed since like 1975. Mm. I'm gonna show. Oh my! You can smell like the the, the is, char and the. Look at that! That jardinier juice. Oh yeah. Right there. That is like amazing. Okay, so look at this. I got the sweet on here. Mm. Oh my god! Mm. Can't really. Oh, there's the sausage. Look at this. It's this a work of art. This is like really, really good. Uh huh. I mean, I don't think those napkins are enough, man. They're, they can't possibly be. Uh, I didn't get mine dipped because I just I thought there'd be calamitous in the car. I thought about it too, and it's like this is already kind of moist and right moist. I said yeah, it, it's moist. the integrity is not going to hold for much longer. No. Mm-mm. And I'm so glad you're a doctor because <laughs> looking at this, we're dead. Yeah, I, you you we're know dead. all your cardiac stuff, right? I mean, this is not cardiac healthy, Mm-mm. but it's tasty. Oh I mean, my that, god, that's the thing. Mm. Mm. My god, mm. <laughs> great! This is really good. This is this really is one of the best in the city. I mean, I mean if not or this Chicago land area, this is. I'm it's telling you, man, I, I, it's like, this is not, I, I, I totally, I didn't eat speechless. anything all day just this, to eat this with you. Yeah, this is his cheat day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Doug McBride is watching. Thanks for watching, Doug. Uh, JP and Fred, thank you for watching, gentlemen. Hey, dude. Oh, yeah, uh, now there we go. It's it, it's broken through. Mm-hmm. My sausage has gone rogue. Not <laughs> the first time I've said that. Well, the aphrodisiac thing scares mm-hmm. me now. Your <laughs> sausage is rogue. So when was the first time I ever established contact with you? I, I think I remember. God, you um, when was that? Here's what I think it was. In the 90s, I did a local music show. Mm-hmm. And I reached out to you. I don't know if I requested an in-studio interview or something, but the response was, hey, man, it's cool if you play us on the radio, but we have to kind of play to the audience that we can't come on the radio station. <laughs> I do have a vague recollection of that. Uh huh. Because it was that one radio station that we had to be anti radio station because mm-hmm. we were so punk rock. Mm hmm. 
which is so kind of stupid when you think about it now. But that was the that was the time. Yeah. And it wasn't just you. No. That, yeah, I think that was actually the response we gave, which is... And I got it. And, you know, it's, it's thinking back still to that, point fence sitter, I, you know. Well, but it's still kind of, you know, as you grow up and you mature, you realize that, you know, we're, we're dying on hills that were completely ridiculous <laughs> hills to die on. You know, it's like, oh, no, this is our stance. Oh, this is bullshit, blah, blah, blah. And then later on you go, well, that was kind of dumb. <laughs> I mean, it, it really is. I mean, we're, we're, the, the, the naivete of youth... Is great. Then you grow up and go, what a bunch of fucking idiots. <laughs> what a bunch of fucking idiots. That whole era, I worked at Q101. You were busy bull weaveling and learning medicine. Mm-hmm. It was like an us versus them. I mean, the punk rock community hated the radio station. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget, I was on an errand with someone from promotions for the radio station. And we were in Wicker Park. And we were at the intersection waiting to turn on the intersection of North Damon in Milwaukee. Dude just walks right up to my window and does this. <laughs> just looks at me. Like, standing there face to face. And I thought it was hilarious. Like, who does that? Like, just so brazenly. Like, go fuck yourself, radio Punk guy. Rock guys do that <laughs> shit. We're brazen motherfuckers. That's right. <laughs> just fuck your radio. I mean, there, there are so few people I would actually go up to and do that. For one, everyone packs guns these days, so I wouldn't... <laughs> right. Well, good thing it's not like an open carry place. You never know. They might conceal it. Exactly. You, you know? But, I mean, it is that whole idea of you got to rebel against something. Mm-hmm. And, like, the you know, the whole thing is, oh, that's, like, the norm. That's the mainstream. No one wants to be mainstream. Screw that. Screw you. Mm-hmm. We're so underground that we're, we're, we're never going to see us. We're buried. We're so underground. <laughs> you know? we, we can't breathe. Then you're burying sure. yourself. That, mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing. But... You know, somehow people survive all that. I mean, that's why we we mature. You survive your youth Mm -hmm. to learn from your mistakes, and you come up and go, oh, shit, yeah, that was kind of (laughs) dumb. That was kind of a little fucked up. This is like candy, by the way. When Mm -hmm. the bread gets the au jus all mixed in there. Well, that's the thing. If you dip this, this would be completely falling apart in your hand. Completely. I mean, it's already moistened up. I mean, this jardinier they put on here was, like, just amazing. I've been waiting to come to Johnny's, waiting for the right person, the right moment. And this is that. This is that, man. This is. I mean, I. I Daryl and I. Daryl and I have been talking about doing this for a couple months now. This mm-hmm. is nothing but payoff here. I swear, I. It was like, where are we going to go to? We had all these places. Like you know, mm-hmm. it was Johnny's. Good. And I thought about Mickey's and other places out you know out here. And I'm like, oh, Johnny's. Yeah, let's get some beef. Well, you, you know? were talking about a lot of go tos mm-hmm. from when you were in med school. Mm-hmm. Well, I got here. We used to go to um, Mickey's and get a big Mickey and. Um, Euro, a riblet sandwich should be all these things you get. Um, go to like you know, Lucky Dog. We used to mm-hmm. go to Joe Prince be back in the day when he used to eat meat. He used to go and eat hot dogs all the time. Joe ate a pizza in here once. I know. <laughs> it's just like, so we go there. <laughs> we go to like Kings and Queens. You know, um, got Parkies. Got Parkies dog. You know, all those places that we go to. I mean, hell. You'd, after you were on call, then you'd wake up the next day, and then you'd be, like, tired. you eat crap. You know, late at night you'd eat crap. But it was good crap. I mean, it was, like, something that made us feel energized. I've, I've said before, I think my favorite cuisine is bar food. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mozzarella sticks, buffalo wings. Well, they're easy. And it's, like, it helps the alcohol, you know, circulate better. That's not medical. It's made it up. It's a, a torsion. Um, but, but, yeah, the Denny's. The Denny's right down the block used to go there all the time after shows. And hang out and just hang out at Denny's all the time. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like this is like old haunts and old places that you remember because you ate there, you know, yeah. and shared a meal with your friends and just did stupid crap, <laughs> you know, which is funny. If it wouldn't kill me, I could eat this every night. Um, maybe yeah. mix it up, have a beef one night, combo another night, right? Because you want to make sure you don't have the sausage didn't take that high. And sausage has a little bit of spice to it, too. Oh, well, you you probably jump. can't tell because of all the jardinera. No, it, it's. The Jardiner adds a special spice to it. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, it's like um, the well, best... the oil. This is like dune spice. That's what it is, you know. <laughs> well, I should, like, go through the war for everything. That's the spice. Dune reference, ladies and gentlemen. Dune reference. One of the me. many reasons <laughs> I wanted Daryl to come in the car is we have similar interests. I'm a geek. You're no stranger to comic books. No. And you're going to think I'm not telling the truth. You're going to think I'm completely... I, I, I planned this. You're wearing a Doctor Strange shirt. Mm-hmm. 
Doctor Strange has put out Bull Weevil's music. Mm-hmm. I too am wearing a Doctor Strange shirt. <laughs> but here's the thing: Stephen Strange has got to be. Yes. Stephen Strange, it is. That's right. The Doctor is in. Same. Uh-huh. I mentioned the movie you're in. Yes. Men. Yes. So, I, tell me about this. It followed uh, the directors, the documentarians, followed four. It, it's going to be a total of six. So, it, it, it right now. So, so men. Oh, see, I thought it was a single movie. No, so it's it's a docu series, is what. Okay, it is. So, okay. So it's it's a. Um, they're going to have six episodes for the first season. Um, I'm one of the episodes in the. But this six. has already debuted at Con, right? They had the first couple episodes debut at Con, yeah. Okay. So, so they had um, the very first episode was with the two brothers called the Moody Brothers, who mm-hmm. are these cowboys who actually hunt wild pigs, you know, in the nation, and um, they debuted their episode, and then they talked about our episode, my episode, and then the other episode, um, and so they had my episode specifically was up for a possibility of getting an award, an HBO documentary award at the um, Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. And it didn't win, but I mean, it was up for an award, which is kind of nice. That's great. Um, you know, it's an honor just to be nominated. It is an honor just to be nominated. Yes, it is. I mean, I like Sally Field, where you, the people really like me. I don't uh-huh. know if they really like me. Um, but the, the, the docu-series is right now focusing on, you know, six men in the United States, African-American men at this mm-hmm. time, but they're going to, you know, in the next series, um, just do a, a multitude of different ethnicities, etc. Um, because the stories really are not just about African-American men. It's the stories about men in general and, and, and the commonalities of the stories are what people, what they want you to really see that, you know, tr- to try and say there's some big difference between myself and somebody else because of the color of my skin is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I mean, the things that make us different are the unique things that we do in life. You know, how I'm a physician, I'm a father, I have a husband, you know, I play a punk rock band, you know, it's like all that stuff right there is kind of like, well, that's crazy. Who does all that stuff at one time? Right. Um, and so that's kind of the the premise behind it is showing that men are are diverse. People are diverse and, and we all have these common stories or these real unique stories that people should see so that we can actually learn about each other. And and, and that's kind of the key thing. Um, right now they're they're in post production on the fourth um, mm-hmm. episode. Um, so they want to finish the six and then they'll start shopping around to, to a multitude of platforms. Um, so it, Eric LaSalle. He directed my portion, yes. Who we all know from ER. Yes, yes. So, so it makes sense. <laughs> Chicago-based TV show, medical-themed TV show. Yes. Totally appropriate to have him direct. Yes, and, and Michael Michelle, who's one of the executive producers, she was also on ER. Yeah. Um, and now they she's, dated on the show, right? Yeah, they, I thought they did for a little while. Maybe they did. So the end because he was dating the other girl. Remember, he was dating the British girl for a while. Oh, right, then, Alex Kingston. Yes, yes. And then, yeah, Michael Michelle was on the show later on. She was the pedi- she was pediatric yes. ER doc. The four- fourth episode is in post production, um, and once they finish the other two episodes, they're going to then start shopping around to figure out where it's going to go. Um, so yeah, right now, you know, Chris Jenkins, who's the other executive producer on the show, um, is doing other projects for Google right now as well. Are you stifling burps from Johnny's as you're? I trying? maybe. You know, uh-huh. I can't, you know, here's the funny thing: I cannot burp. What do you mean you can't burp? I, I cannot burp. That is something I cannot do. I just can't. I just, it's impossible for me to drink, physically you, do that. Can you drink no, your root I beer drink really this, fast? I, like, it doesn't, I can't do it. I honestly can't. But my, I've so, learned so much already. Yes. <laughs> my gastroesophageal sphincter is really, really tight. I can't burp. Uh, I'd like to thank, I just, <laughs> I just had Bob Stroud pop on there. Uh, I wanted to let him know that Utopia is putting out a vinyl release uh, specifically for Record Store Day. Oh, nice. He's a Todd Rungard fan. That's very good. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. All right, go ahead. So, so, so you know that the episode is you know a part of the docu series, and it's going to be, you know, uh, showing the lives of men, and hopefully have this commonality that people can see. Um, and uh, you know, I'm excited for it. it. It's like, I mean, it sounds really cool. It's it's really cool. I mean, the, the bits and pieces of it, putting it together, you know, having the filming done, not only you know here in Chicago, but in LA. We played out in LA. We went out out west. Um, you know, uh, here at the hospital, they filmed me um, a couple days there with my family. You know, just the whole aspect of the back at Cook County. You know, I had a day where I went back to county where I trained. Um, and it's like just the, the whole experience itself was amazing. And, I, and I'm very proud of it. It's, it's like one cool. of those things I can't wait for it to come out and people to see it. Because I think it's an important thing right nowadays specifically 
to allow people to see that, hey, the commonalities that we all share are really, really right. They're more important than any difference that people really want to, you know, kind of conceive. The, the differences are minuscule. The, the commonalities are right. there. And the amazing things that people do are freaking beyond amazing. So so it's, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. All right. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, thank you. Uh, this full episode, the full podcast episode will be available on Carcon Carne in a week or so weekish. Uh, we'll be talking all about bull weevils and music and punk rock and more medical stuff. Uh, but thank you for watching. That's Daryl. Hi. And uh, we're done eating, so I'm going to make the... I'm going to get another sandwich. <laughs> As I'm trying to wrap this up, when the video feed crashed, we were looking at each other, kind of sizing each other up like, what Should if we, we were to sandwich? get another round of sandwiches? Would we look like gluttonous fools? I don't know. I, I mean... I don't, get, I don't get to Johnny's that often. I didn't when I eat do, any, I should make I it count. I fasted all day. I should eat two sandwiches. I need that. I'm six foot, like, ten. Well, the, you are. I mean, I need to so eat, like, here's more. the cliffhanger for you to listen to the podcast at home. Do we go and get more sandwiches? Find out on an all-new Carcon Carne. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right, thank you for watching Facebook Bye, Live. Guys. We started talking about the 90s. Yeah. You guys got started at the very beginning of the 90s. Things took off for you. What do you remember most fondly about that period? I, I mean, the thing I remember most fondly about the '90s, um, I guess it's the, the the camaraderie of the, I guess the scene. You know how everybody has this whole thing of the scene and what mm-hmm. it was. Um, but it was more cohesive. It was because it was smaller. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the thing you didn't have such wide access. To bands, you had to discover bands in the old-fashioned way of listening to music and people turning you on to music. I mean, the the internet wasn't like it was. I mean, it wasn't huge. It was right, people like weren't that. trading MP3s. No, no, you had to sit there and say, "Hey, I have the seven inch. Here's what this is. Yeah. Listen to this." Um, You'd go to record stores. Yeah, and, and that was the thing. Like, I remember going to record stores with my buddies and just hanging out there. That's the mm-hmm. thing you do. It was an, an experience to go, and. I think that the the thing I miss about the 90s is that kind of spirit. I mean, the, the same people are still, of course, we're now playing music still, which is great. So mm-hmm. all of those people that have been friends of ours forever and friend of mine's forever are, are out there still doing it. So that's kind of great that we can all still go out and play music. And I had stuff. Dennis Buckley in the car yes. a couple months ago. So, so when I, when I buddy, so it's like, that's great. Um, but when you think about the number of bands that were around at the time, it's, it was definitely a finite number, it felt that mm-hmm. way. And, and so... And people went to shows. That's the thing that happens. People right. don't have the gumption to go to shows. They were events. They weren't just like, yeah, maybe I'll go. Maybe I'll go see some bands. And you want to discover new bands that mm-hmm. way, you know. And, and and now it's harder in some sense to do that. People discover things and they sit in their home. They can Facebook Live stuff instead of going right. to an event. It's um, so true. So I mean, the the nineties I think had its big heyday of people going out to shows as events and experiencing new bands and having them grow organically in a way. And I think that organic growth of things has kind of been lost in some sense. Well, you had a place like the Fireside Bowl. Yep. And yes. That, that fostered a lot of that community. And it did. And I mean, you think about those shows there, it's like that place was a dingy, you know, hole. I mean, the bathroom there. Well, I, had I was going to so, say, so, like, oh, God, I, I've almost caused horrible bladder and... <laughs> kidney damage just by holding my pee right. anything it took to not have to go there right because i mean it was like it didn't it was like a hole in the wall almost it was <laughs> like things could come in and grab you and pull you through like a chud could be underneath there or something to pull you through so i mean it, but it was like that was still our hole in the wall that was our place to go and hang out and and you know then then you know you made it this is when you made it you knew you made it when you played the metro that was like your thing. That was your stage to play. Yeah, there, there was like a trajectory that, that everyone kind of understood. Yes, yes. And now it's Were like... Were you guys banned from the Metro? For, I, technically, yes. <laughs> technically, yes. Um, yeah, there was, you know, an altercation that took place during a show and the words were said and then it was like... So, yes, we were banned. Supposedly, you know, when... when I talked to Joe Shanahan about it later on. It's like, the oh, no, you weren't really, you weren't really banned. I'm like, but that, they said to us, we were walking up stage, you are banned from here. You can't play here again. You're banned. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose it was in legend it lives on that we were completely banned from there. And I, and I remember the words being said to us. We were allowed back later on after, you know, things changed and things like that. But 
Yeah, we were banned for a little bit of time. And then the fire side was, of course, where we played all the time. So, not to harp on it, but the banning <laughs> was over what? Um, fighting for... Okay, so there was there was a statement that was made that we don't want to have anybody stage diving or causing any ruckus. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, as long as you don't kick people out, that's fine. Mm-hmm. So that was the deal that was made. No handshake, but a verbal deal. Right. Cool. So we start playing, and then people get on stage. Yeah. Particularly my Betty, my best buddy Paul, bring back Paul from the record We've Alive. He gets on stage, he stage dives, and I believe he gets kicked out. Mm-hmm. Dennis gets on stage as well. Buckley gets on stage. Mm-hmm. He gets beat up and kicked out. So then it becomes a whole statement of, we're not going to allow this. People are getting kicked out. Blah, blah, blah. F you, blah, blah, blah. And so if, if people are getting kicked out, we do whatever the fuck you want, kind of, is the whole idea. You know, inviting anarchy. Inviting mm-hmm. a rebellion. Inviting a riot. Mm-hmm. So... We say, fuck it, people get on stage, we don't give a fuck what you do. So people start getting on stage, and then it becomes more anarchic. The bouncers start throwing fists at people, people who can't fight back. Mm-hmm. Ken throws a punch at one of the bouncers and misses, but he was going to knock the guy out. Oh, my God. And it then just degenerated from there. And then after that, I said a few words that were pretty... Raw, but I bet they were well articulated. I think I used a lot of you know uh, colorful words that mm-hmm. probably did not um, match to a man of my intelligence at the time. <laughs> um, so I said, "Yeah, you know, f this place, <laughs> this things like that." And um, you know, I was young. I was young. Yeah, I was young. Full and of piss, and full vinegar. of piss and vinegar, yeah. anger, and whatever. And so. We said, yeah, fuck this place, do whatever the fuck you want, blah, blah. I remember when this place used to be cool and blah, 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 punk rock. Yeah. All the, you know, kind of that whole thing of people flipping off Q101, that kind of yeah, punk, yeah, punk yeah. rock shit. <laughs> and then so we then played our last song, and I said, fuck this place, we're never playing this place again. I throw the microphone down on the ground, and as we're walking off, yeah, you're never playing this place again. I'm like, oh, we're banned. Confirmed. So <laughs> there you go. And um, was that, you came, no, you came back. We did come back. Yeah. It, well, what the rumor is is that afterwards... Pennywise went to play there. I, now I saw a Pennywise show. I was, I didn't want to bring it up because I, I didn't want to convolute your story. I remember seeing Pennywise maybe in, Jesus, ninety four, ninety five, very similar stuff. Like they basically invited the entire floor on stage with them. So what was said, rumor was said to Pennywise is that, hey, we don't want any Bull Weevils incidents happening here. I'm like, we have an incident named after us. That's amazing. Excellent. So yeah, I, I think I was at that Pennywise show. That was after we were banned for causing a ruckus. Oh my god! So that's the rumor. Um, I I can either confirm or deny it, but that is the rumor. Well, now, I remember there, there was weirdness between the punk rock community and Metro in the early '90s. Like I want to say, what, was it Ben Weasel? He like tried to spearhead a, like a full on boycott of the venue. Yeah, so we, we that was the whole time when everybody had their factions and we were all signing these, you know, little, you know, this this anti-playing the Metro, um, you know, uh, missive. And we signed it out of night being naive and thinking this is the right thing to do because it's so punk rock not to do that. But then we're like, what, what is that? That didn't make sense. And then, you know, um, it was uh, Mark Ruvalo started doing shows there with Johan's face and doing mm-hmm. shows. And it was like, hey, we're going to start doing shows here at the Metro, kind of punk rock shows for a low price. Mm-hmm. And hey, let's do this. And so we're like, yeah, why not do this? Like, well, <laughs> we'll do this. So, of course, we signed a contract. Well, it wasn't really a binding contract. And then we broke it thinking, what the fuck? How more punk rock is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> Whatever. So, you know, so we, we decided to play the Metro. And, and I, I guess at the time there's supposed to be some show – we were supposed to play with Propagandi, and then Propagandi wasn't going to play there because the Metro had, you know, corporate sponsorships and all this other stuff. And then it was like we looked like the bad guys because we were playing this corporate sponsored place and blah blah blah. And it's like you know what? In the end, once again, as I look back on all the petty little squabbly, stupid little things that were done, it it was completely ridiculous and and high schoolish and naive and you know petty and none of that stuff really even matters in the end. You look at it and go, why wouldn't you want to play that stage? Why wouldn't you want to play that venue? Why, 
why wouldn't you want to play in a place that has great sound? Why wouldn't you want to right. play in a place that has a, that has a big capacity for people to see you play? Why would you not want to do that? What, right. what part of that? If you know, just go play in your basement. That's like just go play in your basement. Play, just play in your bloody basement. So, um, you know, so we played those shows, and they were great shows. That's when you know, in another heyday of the Metro and some not heyday, but punk rock the Metro stuff. That was these low dose shows that oh, yeah, you know, it, it you know Juan's face put on. I, mean, and, I was going to say, I feel like I, I saw a Sidekick Kato and not yeah. Rebecca like every other week. Yes, and that, that was like great. We got to play the place where we saw Naked Ray Gun playing. Yeah. You know, where we could go, hey, you made it because you're playing that stage. And that's kind of the whole, you know, the, the rise. There you go, like, hey, you're playing this place, you're playing these little places, you're, you're working, you're working, working, and now you made it. Mm-hmm. Now, Ray Gun is the Rosetta Stone for the Bull Weevils. Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, you started, you formed a bond. Yes. That was that was our bonding experience of all of us going to those shows and hanging out, being the survivors in the front. Now I remember I, w- I was young in the 1980s, youngish, um, but I remember Reagan. Reagan was, I mean, that was the bar. Yes, I mean they looked cool. They had the, in the Chicago cop coats, the boots, the whoa whoa whoas. They, they were and still are. They're they're the shit. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. That was like you you had this bar that you said. That's what I want to be. I mean, one of the goals I had in being in a band, which is which is kind of like a, you had to have these goals to reach for, and one of the goals was like, I want to have dinner with those guys. I want to hang out and have dinner with them. That they, I want to meet them and have dinner with them. And you know, we we had that goal happen. We 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 were at Pierre's house for like the Fourth of July and for other like kind of holidays and things, hanging out. And and some of the best advice we had gotten was from John Kesdy, um, you know, of Effigy's fame, mm-hmm. who said to us, <laughs> "He's sitting there." In this chair, and we're at Pierre's house. Speaking and of the effigies, I love your body bag cover. Thank you. Always have. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I mean, it's like we gotta gotta pay homage to the Chicago bands that mm-hmm. made us who we are. So, um, so we're at his we're at the Kesey's house, and John's like, "You those bow weevils guys?" I'm like, "Yeah." Let me give you some advice. Never go on tour. <laughs> Never go on tour. Like, we already good on tour. Never go on tour. Okay. Thank you very much, well, what sir. Was the, what was the thought process? I didn't ever ask. We were too afraid. We were too afraid. We were we were intimidated because it was said in such a stern, fatherly kind of father knows best. I'll beat you with a belt kind of way that we're like, okay. And I, I don't want to focus <laughs> on all these other bands. I, I do want to talk about Bow Weevils. Yeah. But talking about going on tour, I mean, things really started to happen for you almost on the West Coast. Yeah, that's the thing. It was like we were we were, you know, releasing records on underdog records you know our mm-hmm. own records and on underdog records here in chicago and you know we <laughs> we had music we're ready to put out and they're like no nah, you're not ready to put out a record yet you're not ready to do this like we're ready to put out a record I said no nah, you're not it's like okay and they, they put out smoking pope's record which is okay they, that's fine they did that but we were ready to put out a record too and so we ken was kind of corresponding with harlan from the band rhythm collision on dr strange records and you know, it was kind of like a passing thing because he had a rhythm collision sticker, and then Harlan's girlfriend saw that when she was here in Chicago, and then Ken started talking to those guys, and so we started corresponding with them. And we kind of had a similar sound, and you know, Doctor Strange, you know, Bill heard our stuff, and we went out west, went on tour, and they kind of like said, "Hey, you know, your guys are going to be on Doctor Strange." So we got on Doctor Strange. We were on that label, mm-hmm. and that was like our. You know, basis for things. We had a real big following in, in Southern California. I mean, that's the thing. We were like a Doctor Strange band, and we still have you know allegiance to that. That's yeah. that's our that's our bread and butter. That's that's who we are. Um, and I remember that being you know kind of a a sticking point to say you're not Chicago. You're you're West Coast. You guys are all you know Epitaph Fat Records. We're like no, we're Chicago yeah. band. We just happen to be on a West Coast label, and we just play the music that's we so like funny. to play. You know, that's that's it. So. Um, you know, it, that was like our, our big, you know, people step. love to, people have to find a way to compartmentalize yes. music. Everyone wants to Epitaphy, categorize stuff. Fat right. Yes. Everyone wants to categorize it. How come it can't just be music that you right. just enjoy? Uh huh. You know, but, but, but we, we are, we are horrible people because we are geeks and everybody wants to have their thing and it's mine and we have this avarice like, this is my stuff. You, you can't yeah. have it. It's, it's so, they were better when they did this. That record's the only good record they made. It's like, you know what? Can you just enjoy the music? And this is wisdom, and I think it's a universal wisdom that comes with age. Yes, it does. Yes, we, it does. We all hit that point. Yes. Not embarrassed to say, you know, I love Depeche Mode. I As go see you him. should. Yes. I, I'm not embarrassed to say I like Sade. She's a great performer. 
Fantastic you know? singer. Fantastic Love her singer. Voice. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know... I, when, when I'm cooking dinner, I could put on a Sade album. I, I, when I'm trying to decompress from a shift, I'll put yeah, on I a Sade. That. That's a thing. So, I mean... You, you got to just love music for what it is. It's like an art form. It's something, an expression of something, and and that's what we get to do. That and yeah. that, that's that's a that's an awesome thing. You, you're just so it's so lucky that although a lot of talented people, I have a lot of talented friends, and all of us get to still do this. Yeah. You know, and live out our you know fantasies of being you know young forever. You know? Do you think in, in the mid '90s? I mean, you basically you know you were focusing on med school yep. as you were doing the bow weevils do you think had you not gone to med school the trajectory of bow weevils would have gone farther probably you know i mean that, that definitely was a rate limiting thing um i mean th- that's one of the reasons why we broke up in the beginning because of medical school um, so were the other guys just pissed oh god they were angry <laughs> they were angry <laughs> yeah i mean and a part of it it was my fault too because you know i i, I didn't want to let them down but i did um because what i didn't do is i, I didn't convey enough that you know we were on tour and I had to start residency you know yeah. I graduated medical school I had to start residency and I didn't really convey in, in the most I guess I don't know upstanding terms to say hey you know what I'm not going to be able to do this tour because I have to leave and start my profession as a physician and I had to leave in the middle of a tour and that was you know completely not cool yeah. um, they were not really I was I didn't prepare them for it. I didn't really. Yeah, you know, I bet that's done. It, it did. Uh-huh. And then you know they finished the tour without me, and then they came back, and then we played a big show in Elgin at this you know at, at you know the Wonderland Ballroom, and we <laughs> played a big show there, and I got to play the show, and it's like oh, Concrete Heroes back, Daryl's in the band again, blah blah blah, and they just were like, I'm gonna stab him in the face. They had every right to do that, you know. I mean, and I and I I realized that 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 caused a lot of bad feelings between. Guys, I've been friends with forever, and you know, because still, when you're in a band, it's like we're going into war together. Like this we are, we're is family. It. We're, we're you, family. You're, you're lockstep. This yes. is it. We're, we're yes. going to take the, take the world by storm. And we are family, and mm-hmm. that's the thing. It is like the people that you spend a lot of time with all the time. I mean, they, they are get they're guys in that this band. I've been with longer than some of the people I've had relationships with in my whole entire yeah. life, and they, I still do. They're they're my best friends. They're like my brothers. They, you know, and, and we go through some crazy stuff and we've survived a lot of things and we've had a lot of fun. We've had a lot of tears. We've had a lot of anger, a lot of fights. And, you know, it sounds like family. It is family. It yeah. is family. And, you know, and with that, sometimes, you know, you can love your family, but you don't have to like them all the time. Yeah. And, and that sometimes happens. Um, but, but I love all these guys in the band now. And, and, and but, but there's still raw feelings with some of the guys previously. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I apologize for that. I'm sorry. And I, I wish it wasn't that way. But that's somehow how some people feel. You can't change how people feel all the time. But you can make them feel better about it by saying, you know, if any of you guys ever get a boo-boo, I can fix it for right. you. Right. <laughs> right. That's true. I can, I can do that. Um, you know, and, and hopefully the boo-boo is not really bad that requires my expertise in emergency position. But, I mean, <laughs> if it is, I'm there for you. Right. And um, you, you can actually kill one of those guys and bring them back to life. That yeah, technically I could do that, but I mean I that would if I couldn't that'd be murder if they stayed <laughs> dead. So that'd be a problem. That's true. Um, you know, resuscitation don't always go the way you want them to go. So um, it depends on what it killed you with. You know? But if you could make a, a zombie bull weevil, I mean that's punk rock. There's, that's th- you know. Don't get me thinking about this. Sorry. This is this is <laughs> get me thinking about this. But I mean it, it is you know the, the the touring stuff got us. To be a you know, sorry a better band and you know and, and really brings us together. I mean it, it's funny that you know when you look at the members of the band now, you know the, the, the our bass player is now our, our buddy Pete. You know um, so Pete Mittler plays in our band and Pete you know was our first driver for our first tour and I That's put amazing. in quotes Rody because he always tells I didn't carry any of your stuff he didn't carry anything he never carried anything but you know but he's our better friend forever and that's like he's in the band with us now and it's so perfect because he's like us right. it, and he knows us we, we've been through all the same stuff together we've played in bands forever we like the same things we hate the same things it's like you know and we can just laugh about things that are just outlandishly outlandish and we can say one thing and we all start laughing about it or we can say something and it's like oh we can and we can debate something and argue about it and still be cool at the end and and that's kind of the coolest thing about being in a band and coming up is that you make these relationships with people that are so tight and the bonds you create with them are are unbreakable i mean they're yeah. they're, they're they're like 
the, the strongest bond you can ever get. And, and, and it's the most wonderful thing to have people like that in your life. Was it Riot Fest that brought you back together? The first thing that got us back together was actually we did a benefit show for WLUW mm-hmm. um, back in like 2003. Um, what was that like? Getting back to get was it was it weird? Was it, it fun? Was it exciting? It was weird at first. It, it was like all these, you know, stipulations on how this was going to work. That we did our first practice. That's when we got our 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 current you know drummer, you know Pete Mumford, who's just amazing. You know, love that guy. Love him. He's great. If Long you like Mumford and Sons, you'll love you love him. Love, love him. Love him. So um, we, we want to start a band with our daughters. You know, like the Wilson, uh, like Mumf. Was it? It's. Will Will some or Mumps, Mumpson or something like that Mumpson, but so we're gonna figure out the name. Um, but it's like they they he came in as our drummer, and we got you know it was Bob and myself and then Ken and Bob and I hadn't spoken for a long time. Ken hadn't, hadn't spoken. You know Ken and I tried to do a little something together as a band that never really it took off. Um, and then we all got together and we like went to a practice space and if it sounded bad, we weren't gonna do it. And, Seems like a good ground rule. And it sounded good. It was like, wow, this is really good. And so it felt natural to start playing mm-hmm. again. And so we did the WLUW show, and it was like, that was, we weren't going to play again. That was like our one-off thing, going to do it. And it was funny because, you know, um, <laughs> when we got out there, I mean, the Traders was, were playing the show. Um, as well as Apocalypse Hobokins was playing the show. And it, the, <laughs> over the... P, the address system we were playing was at the Metro. They kept playing the statement I made we're never fucking playing this place again. Over on <laughs> a loop. We're never fucking playing this place again. Over on a loop. We're never fucking playing this place again. I'm like, well, I guess we lied. So there you go. So that was funny. It's like, that's the kind of stuff that can happen where you, all these people that have been friends yours forever yeah. can make these personalized jokes yes. to get you to say, remember when you said that stupid stuff, Daryl? Here it comes back to get you because we remember it all and here it goes. So but that, that kind of levels the playing field. Like it does. It, it does. It does. It enables you to move forward. It does. And it's, and it's fun. And so when you look back in it, you know, back in the day, you could be petty and go, oh, this sucks. You're totally calling me out. But it's like, it's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. You, know, you got to laugh at yourself. Um, but, you know, Monica Ebley got us back together. Uh, Justin Prison. You know, if you're out there, Justin, you know that. Justin Schwimmer, Justin uh, from Underground Communique got us back together um, and got that show put up for us. So we did the WLUW show. And that was like our first foray back. And then we were like, we're not playing again. And then Ken and I still kept trying to get something together playing. We figured that why were we, why do we hate each other? We didn't hate each other anymore. I was like, this is stupid. We're, we're again, adults. Age and wisdom. Yes, age and wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, and my lovely wife was saying, why do you guys hate each other? It's stupid. It's like, you guys have been friends forever. Why? That's stupid. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. So Ken and I started playing music a little bit. And then Riot Fest in 2006, that was the next thing that got us back together. And that kind of got us back together permanently to play again. Um, you know, we did that show, you know, Reagan did it. We played the show at, at the now defunct double door, God rest its soul. Great place. <laughs> um, that pre-show. And then we played at the Congress and it was awesome. God, maybe not rest that soul. <laughs> <laughs> Dangerous place. But I mean, <laughs> but that was awesome to have those shows. I mean, yeah, that was sure. a big thing to get us back together and we started playing. And then, you know, Mike afterwards said, you guys keep playing, you know, he talked about them. He said, yeah, sure. And we, we started playing again and we, the funny thing is we had more opportunity to do more things, but we didn't really strike while the iron was hot. We didn't take the opportunities because, you know what, there were a lot of things going on in people's lives, you know, that, you know, families and other things sure. are, are important things that can't, don't allow the same frivolity that you have when you want to play in a band. And so that's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I, I believe Bob left the band, you know, he, he had things he had to do with his family. That was the important thing. And that was his priority. And that's right. You know, um, he would come from almost near Wisconsin to come down to my house to practice, which was forever. And it's like those yeah. things, you know, when you're playing, you know, a show here and there, it wasn't worthwhile for him to do that. Sure. So, um, you know, and, and that, that was a sad moment for us to have him leave the band. Um, but you know, like I said, we moved on and we have, you know, who we are now and, and we, we still, ha- we're having fun. We're doing a great, you're making great new music. I mean, you yes. put out that seven inch a couple years ago. Yes. We have, we have new songs we have that we're working on right now. You know, you we created your own theme song. Yes, we did. We finally did that. You're we, like the banana we splits. It. We've made it. That's the only thing. If you don't have a theme song, there's nothing. There's right. something wrong with you. Don't Ramones had one. Right. Right? You, every great band has a theme song. Now uh-huh. we've got our theme song. And it, it's an earworm. It gets in your ear and it doesn't it go does. away. Um, so, 
that's what we're doing. We're writing new songs. We've toured. We've gone out and toured again. We've, mm-hmm. toured, we've gone internationally and played. I mean, well, that's the thing. We, we mentioned his name earlier, and I, I hate to blow smoke up his ass because he, he might like it, but didn't 88 kind of figure out how to come back gracefully and powerfully? What, nine times they've done that? I yeah, guess. but that's I mean, this, like, this, I mean this how many lives does Cat have? This one seems to have really taken. I mean, this... <laughs> yes. Yes, they have. I mean, I, I, I'm really, you know, love Dennis. He's one of my best friends. I love that guy. You know, we always refer to each other Skip. Um, from Stir Crazy, by the way. If nobody knows, Stir Crazy. Great movie. One of the best movies ever made, Stir Crazy. Um, Pryor and Wilder. Yes, mm-hmm. Pryor classic. and Wilder. Great classic team mm-hmm. up. And, and Dennis, I think of ourselves in that vein a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have to say that those guys have continued to work and push and do those things. And it's like it takes a dedication that, you know, it's hard to sometimes have. Yeah. And, you know, all those guys. I mean, Dan pushes like that. Um, you know, Dennis pushes like that. And yeah, they've come back, and it's like that's good. They they, they have a, a feeling of like this is good, this is right, this is the right time, and you know put out the new record, and they've gone on multiple, you know jaunts out, they keep on doing jaunts out, and it's like that's good. I mean, it, it, it's something that I'm proud of to say these people are talented people that I know that yeah. are my friends, and we've known each other. We've come up through a lot of stuff, and it's like I have to tip my hat to them all the time and say that's the way that works, and, and they figured out a way to do it. And not interfere with a lot of things at the same time. You, you and, and I invoke their name. And that, this is, I realize this isn't about 88 Fingers Louie, but I invoke their name because the timetable yeah. of their comings and goings is not all that different from the Bull Weevils. Right, right. We, I, we, we did it less because we didn't have to keep coming and going <laughs> <laughs> for some odd reason. But they, they definitely, because we, we all came up in the same vein. I mean, yeah. that's, that's like, you know, I, I, I was... We were all there at the inception of that band being birthed. Yeah, you know, um, you know, took Dennis to a to a tryout and said, "Here, just go up there and do it." You know, and, and look, I created a monster. By that That's happened. amazing. But I mean, it is like those things where you see all these bands that are doing this, and people that in bands that we know. I mean, guys who are in Apocalypse Hope are doing the Mons. I mean, that band's amazing. You know, and, and that's you go like these are guys we've all known forever. Yeah, and you know, guys still putting out great music great energy and when we see each other it's like this is old home week and it's fun yeah and we still can just do talking this. about this is fun yeah it, it's like th- that's the thing you, you can't you know what i always ask the question at practices and i always say whatever happened to fun and the thing is that's a, a question anybody should ask themselves every day because that's a good starting point yes there's so much crap that people run into and so much stuff that well, brings you, people you see down. horror shows come to life every day yeah every day and you know what if you can't have fun in life then what the hell, man? There's something wrong with you. You have to learn how to have fun. Everything can't be the doom and gloom and the, and the apocalypse is coming, the world's falling apart. And I mean, while all that may be true, right? you have to be able to eat a beef sandwich with... Yeah, friends and eat yeah. and just have a good time. It's like, that's enjoy those moments because mm-hmm. that's fun. You know, it, it can't be like every tragedy is like, oh my God, this movie is so not to canon. I can't believe <laughs> that, you know, the human torch is a black guy. What the hell? Bullshit. I call... It's like... Just enjoy it. It's fun. There's superhero movies being made, for Christ's sake. Enjoy right. it. And furthermore, if that's the issue you have with that Fantastic Four movie... Right. That's you didn't see the other Fantastic Four movies, then you see like, what the hell? They all kind of suck, but it's like, enjoy it for what it is. Yes. Enjoy it for what it is, for Christ's sake. Come on. Um, so, it, it's like, that's the idea of, like, bands and music and the scene and going out to shows and seeing all the people. It is fun. And it is like, you can't put a price tag on that. That it's is so something true. that you get inside of your soul and go, dude, this is awesome. I mean, we, we were in Montreal playing. It's like, dude, this is awesome. We're in Montreal playing a show. Right. It's, it's, it, we were in England. We're like, dude, we're, over the, we're overseas playing a show. This, we're playing shows in England. This is awesome. And, so, and that's tell me, awesome. Tell me about the reception there. So it's funny. We, we had, you know, first day, we're playing, you know, we hang out in England. We're having a good time. We, we, we come out, we play at the Underworld. And it's like, Bad Religion is playing right down the block from us. Our show is 20 pounds. Their show is about the same. Who do you think people went to go see? For the same price? What? Bad Religion, of course. Yeah, okay. I, I didn't want to say they went... You to say? Of course they went to see. Come on, we all know who they saw. Okay. It's like, we had people at the show. It's like, well, that's not a lot. And they're like, okay, we played. They still paid us because they're going to have some government subsidies mm-hmm. where they pay bands, of course, which is kind of great. So they paid us. Then we play the next show, and people are already headed to Rebellion Festival, so we played a you know empty room. We're playing, and we're like, okay, cool. But then we get to play a show in Leeds with Scream, and 
that's awesome in itself. We're yeah, absolutely. For Christ's sake. And then it's like, well, this show is amazing. This is awesome. This is great. It was amazing. Guy didn't try to pay us, and we had to threaten him, but we got paid. So that was good. Don't Typical try to take money away from the seven-foot-tall punk rock singer. No, mm-hmm. no. Chicago was invoked multiple times. Do you know what happens in Chicago? That's right. Have you seen the news? We're all murderers. You don't realize we are murderers. So, um, <laughs> so... They, you just made me snort. Yes, we did invoke the <laughs> Chicago card of we are all murderers. We're all murderers. You know, so... so <laughs> Then we, we we went to Rebellion, and we played Rebellion, and we played a room that was a 500-capacity room. It was, like, filled. It was like, I mean, that was amazing. We had people from Scotland that were like, we loved the Bowie Bowls. Like, we, this is like hearing people from overseas waiting to come see us play. And that right there you go, oh, this is completely worth it. This is awesome. That is completely worth it. You know, and, and we had a great time just hanging out with the bands that were there, meeting people. You know, we, we have our new brothers in arms, and this band Borrowed Time. Um, you know, Robert, he, amazing human being who was our, who was our driver and he, his band played and we got to hang out and hang out with his family. And, you know, Robert and Helen, him and his wife, they were just wonderful human beings. And I have to give a shout out to them. They were wonderful and love them like brothers and sisters. And they, they were great. Um, and, you know, can't wait to do that again at some point. Yeah, that's a well, thing. That, that leads me to my next question. You're having so much fun watching you talk about this, the animation <laughs> you're showing me as you're talking about like you're all in yeah so where does that leave bull weevils in 2017 well i mean right now you know we're going to play this show coming up with peg boy you know, which one of our buddies you know part of the best. naked ray gun family yes tree. yes, yes. Well, our, our friends in arms and peg boy on black wednesday you know the john haggerty by the way one of the most subtle quiet dudes i've ever met and one of the greatest guitar players ever to grace without a doubt ever to grace <laughs> planet and yes, John's birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday to John. Uh, we're recording this yes. in mid-October. Yes, in October. Or October, yes. if you prefer. Happy birthday to John. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so we're playing with Pegboy on the 22nd. Um, and that's, you know, November 22nd. That'll be that'll be one of our shows that we'll play. And then, you know, we're just looking to record new stuff, get our recordings done, um, keep ourselves in tune, and then wait till the next year. I mean, right now, it, the big things that I have going on, my wife was ill, so making sure that she's well. Mm-hmm. Um, Got to make sure first. the family's all good. Mm-hmm. Um, and make sure those things, because yeah, we, we had a pretty busy 2017 when it comes down to it. Um, and you got to make sure that, you know, you take care of the family stuff first and then you can do the other things afterwards. But I mean, this is my outlet. I mean, that's the thing I do yeah. this is my outlet in the band, but you know, I'm sure, that, I mean, we haven't said it enough in this interview, but I mean, you are a medical professional. You oversee right. an emergency room. Yeah. So, you so know, you see some, you see some shit go down. Yeah. So yeah. you need to scream and yell and thrash on stage. <laughs> I do. I do. But, you know, and, and that's like, you know, just one aspect of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the reality is that the other parts of me that are super important is like, you know, I'm a husband, you know, I'm a father. And those things are important. I got to make mm-hmm. sure that my wife's good. I got to make sure my kids are good. Yeah. You know, and make sure that they have, you know, dad who can, you know, provide to them and give them teaching about stuff. And I mean, they, they love music, which is really good. Um and, you know, my youngest said, I want to be a rock star. I'm like, oh, don't say it to your mother. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but it, it's like, that's kind of the stuff that you have to also prioritize too. And yeah. it's sometimes hard to juggle all of it. it, it, it to, to juggle, you know, the life as a physician, life as a husband, life as a father, and then add in life as a guy who plays in the rock and roll band. You're busy. It, it, it's busy. And, you know, it's like things get juggled around. Sometimes things get dropped and sometimes things get, you know, partially broken you got to put them back together and, and you can't you know let any of that fall learning how to juggle those things is kind of the key thing and i i guess i like to juggle um but you know it's sometimes hard because some people look at you and go you're not paying enough attention to this you know or you got to pay enough attention to this you're not paying attention to this aspect this it's aspect hard to do can... everything great right it's much easier to do everything okay right and and that's where you know you sometimes have to be put into check and mm-hmm. say you know what and that's what it takes it takes you know a wife to put you in check. It takes your kids to put you in check. Yep. It takes, you know, the sobering things of your profession to put you in check, you know. But then at the same time, you need to be able to say, I need to check out of this for a second and do this to make sure I can be capable of doing all these other things at the same time. Completely get it. That's, I mean, that's what this podcast is for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I completely understand. Right. And, this and, is my release. And, and, it, and it, it, but it is, you got to be, you got to be cognizant of this stuff because sometimes you can lose sight of it because it, it gets mm-hmm. like, oh my God, the, the fun of running around playing the show is great. But it's like afterwards, you still got to deal with like getting up at six in the morning for your kids. You know, right, you could like be a, an absolute fucking rock star on stage, 
But the next morning, you're still dad. Right. right. You still have to get food on the table. Right. It's hey, like rock star, get out of bed. It's time to take care of the kids. And you know what? And that wouldn't be able to happen if I didn't have... Uh, my wife was not the one who's awesome. I mean, if, mm-hmm. if I didn't have her to do and help out, I'd be a freaking mess, a failure. You know, that's the thing. You got to have that other partner. And so, you know, got to give shout out to her for being a patient and, you know, you know, really overly patient sometimes individual to say I can still do this stuff. Should I, should I thank her for letting you hang out in the car? And you... Yes. Thank you. Thank I really you. do appreciate it. You seem like a very nice person. Yes. Thank you, Julian. So it, it is one of those things that, you know, there, there are, you know, the, the, the balancing acts and juggling that you do um, can sometimes totally trip you up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to sometimes step back and go, hold on, take a breath, do this. But, yeah, we want to record the new stuff. You know, we, we have a lot of new stuff. We were working on a new song just the other day at practice. And <laughs> it's funny because it, it became a big point of contention. We're just looking at each other like, what the hell? And Ken's looking at me going, Dude, this is totally simple, and, and it's like just do it. And like, I, I, I'm not getting it. And like, what, what's the matter? <laughs> and he calls me out and says, "You know, maybe there's something wrong with you. Maybe you just. I think you could do way better for this." I'm like, "Wow." Now, back in the old days of the '90s, there may have been some fisticuffs and some yeah. angry. But you know what? He's right. And I'm like, "No, you, dude, you know me better than a lot of people, so you're right." Could do better on this, so we got to work on this. So let's mm-hmm. get it done. So that comes with maturity, absolutely, and AIDS. And now it's like. Oh yeah, criticism doesn't mean that you suck. Criticism means we're gonna do this better because we can do better than this, and so that's where we're at now, which I think is really, really good. I, I, I have to say that makes me really laugh about things and go like, God, we used to argue about the stupidest things back in the day. So Routes true. to take. We were, we were arguing about a route to take on tour a long time ago, and it, Ken and I were at a Wiener Schnitzel and got into a little fist fight. It wasn't even a fist fight. We were like kind of clenching and kind of wrestled out of the Wiener Schnitzel in, in New Mexico. And that's when everybody else got in the van and left us there. Oops, sorry. Left us there to fend for ourselves. And like, as we're fuck sitting, like, these in the guys. heat. Like, yeah, well, we're in the heat sitting there waiting. And we're like, yeah. oh, okay. We fought about a route to take to get to the next show. That's stupid. Um, nowadays, it's like, hey, we're playing shows, dude. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's we're still bad. doing it. It's 2017. Right. Right. Giddy up. Right. Get up. Let's go. Where are we going? And we like each other. And we do. And we do. All right. So for people who want to reinvest in the bull weevils who want to follow you into the future, where do they go? So you can go to our Bandcamp page, mm-hmm. um, which you can. All your stuff's there. Yes, all our stuff's there on the Bandcamp page. You can go there. You can even find us on streaming services out there mm-hmm. if you want to look for us there. Um, you can go to iTunes if you still do that and go to iTunes. We can go to Bandcamp, which is where exactly it goes right to the band. And then also, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time on Bandcamp. Yes, Bandcamp. You can discover many, many things on Bandcamp, which mm-hmm. is good. Um, so that's where you can get all of our stuff. You can follow us on Facebook. Um, if even anybody does that, we have a Twitter account too, I think, which I don't know if anybody posts to it. I know our media guy kind of posts to it. Paul, get on that. And then also, um, I guess we have an Instagram too, but I've never seen any pictures go up on it at any time. So I'm thinking Facebook, <laughs> Facebook and Bandcamp is probably the yes, way to go. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to buy like shirts, you go to Anxious and Angry, which is run by Ryan Young from uh, Off With Their Heads. Um, great guy. Um, you know, wonderful person to deal with. Fun person. Um, respect to him. And, you know, so you can find all of our stuff on Anxious and Angry if you want to buy shirts um, to represent Chicago, Bull Weevil style. Hmm. Um and, you know, because we always have something that has to do with Chicago in our shirts. Right on. Which is crazy. Um, and uh, that's where you can find most of our stuff. All right. So I, I saved the most important question for last. Yeah. In your collection, your favorite comic book, the one that you would rescue from a burning home. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. Boy, that's hard. Ah. <sighs> Man, that is a difficult question. There's not that one, that one Silver Age book that you can't believe you have in your collection. <sighs> you know, there are a bunch of books, though, and I gotta think of one. Oh, jeez. Oh, I'll give you my two. Okay, give me your two. Uh, Avengers 57. Okay. First appearance of the Vision. Yep. And Superman 199, the Superman Flash race. Okay, that's good. Um, let's see. I have messed you up. You've messed me up. That is a really good question. I'm trying to think of like one comic book that I would want to save out of all the comic books. Well, 
Damn. No problem talking about medicine. No problem talking about the bull weevils. The no one problem talking about Metro in. and getting banned. The I ask you about a comic book. Man, you blew my it's mind. It's like I just put an SAT in front of you. You did. <laughs> and it's like, I'm only going to score like 1,300 on this. Um, that's not a bad score. But that's, that's, I mean, shoot. You're killing you me. Okay, you know hold means, on. means you don't even read comic books. I, you know you're, you're an asshole. That's, that means you're an asshole is what that means. Maybe I read too many comic books. Maybe, maybe I just read too many. Maybe I read too many comic books, sir. And I can't think of just one because I have multitudes that I'd like to save. My God. It's like, there's... I, I keep coming to this Daredevil, you know, I can't remember the number of it. It's it's the one where he his radar sense goes crazy and he has to go back to meet Stick. It was in the Miller time when Miller's writing for mm-hmm. writing Daredevil. I, I have a whole run of Daredevil. For a while, back maybe 15, 20 years ago, I said, I'm going to try to collect every Daredevil comic. I don't know why, because a lot of those runs are just awful. Right. But what really inspired me, I found Daredevil number one on eBay in absolutely horrific condition. <laughs> Cover hanging by a thread, chunks ripped off, like marker on the back. I think it was $15. Wow. It was total, wow. like, just a library copy. Wow. I said, well, if I can get my hands on number one, what else can I do? So you started searching. Started searching. Like, oh, Daredevil number seven, the first red costume. And- right. So, <laughs> so I there that... I'm trying to think of that Daredevil, but I can't remember. It's a white cover. And Daredevil's jumping up. And he's got his. I think I know which one crazy. you're talking about. Yeah, and that's that's like a comic. I bought that as a kid mm-hmm. from a drugstore, like off the rack, off the thing. spinner rack, yeah, off the spinner rack. Yeah. And I remember we were going on a road trip. Like my family was going on a road trip, and I read that thing like cover to cover multiple times, just reading that. And it was like Daredevil was a character I never really got into until I read that. And I'm like, Daredevil's awesome. Daredevil's awesome. And so so. I'm going to get my Daredevil pen right now. And so I'm like, that's the comic I would try and save. Um, there, there's like a weird, we had a, a comic, there was a misprint of a Thor comic where he fought the Midgard Serpent. Mm-hmm. And it's misprinted, it's printed backwards. And there were like a bunch of copies that were misprinted backwards that my brother and I got. So it was like a manga. Yeah, so I'm like, this is crazy. <laughs> it's like printed backwards. I'm like, so he bought a bunch of them. They're probably not worth anything, but it was a cool comic. And then there's... A, what, what well, other? do you remember the first one you ever got? First comic I ever got. It was um, Spider Man, and remember the the Punisher, mm-hmm. the where the Punisher's like targeting Spider Man. Right. That, that's I think that was his first appearance. Right. Yep, that's, that was one twenty nine. That's one of the first comics I got. That's pretty cool. I don't have it anymore, which is ridiculous. It's one of the first comics I got. The first comic book I ever got was Defenders number four. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's and crazy. I think that was the first appearance of Valkyrie. That's crazy. And then. Going back to say the comics that then kept on coming in, I remember we had that comic, and the thing that we did, I remember getting a, a you know, Kazar comic back in the mm-hmm. day. It was one of the first comics I got. It was Kazar. I remember having that, and my brother and I, as little kids, not knowing what the hell, we would color them. Just color them. I'm going, hmm, that was kind of dumb. It's so interesting you say that. Uh, Marvel and DC, for a while, I think they both stopped doing it. They put out these black and white trade paperback collections of all their old comics. So you can color them. I thought they would make amazing coloring yes, books. Yes, they would be. <laughs> like, that would be the coolest. I, I, I'm, I, coloring, coloring books aren't my thing, but I thought, man, if I were seven, eight years old, I'd probably color the shit out of those. Yes, you probably would. You probably would. I mean, that's what, I mean that K, so Kazar and that Punisher first appearance comic were like, to the first comics I ever had. That's cool. And and, it, and that Kazar, I remember coloring that running around dinosaurs and all that crap. Like, oh, Kazar in the Savage Land and doing his thing. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, coloring, 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 coloring. Um, but then it's like, you know, as I got older, like comics became like, this is like, I mean, picking up Moon Knight and, and I mean, it's like funny. Mm-hmm. It's like, you think, oh yeah, Moon Knight's like the Batman of the Marvel Universe. He's kind of a weirdo and he's, he's really not, I guess Daredevil's more Batman in a sense, but I agree with that, but but Moon Knight is kind of Batman because he's got the rich persona. And mm-hmm. You can do all. The, it, he had multiple personas, which I always thought was the coolest. Yes, and, and it's like then playing onto his whole idea of having multiple personalities and being insane. And is he insane? Is he not? Which I, I still like. I still like mm-hmm. Moon Knight. Don't don't get me wrong. Moon Knight's a cool character. I still love him. Um, they keep bringing him back with new iterations. Literally all the, time. the whitest character in comics. Most le- <laughs> yes, except for no, except for also um, White Tiger. Mm, good point. Though she's not, though. She's usually Latino. She is. <laughs> so I guess not. She is. I guess not. Mm-hmm. I guess not. Oh, okay, one more 
comic I remember from my childhood. Uh, it was a Marvel Treasury edition. I used to love these. Those oversized tabloid yep. comics. Yes, those were awesome. There was one. It was the Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, and it was a reprint of uh, Marvel. Marvel had a lot of martial arts magazines, and it was a team up between Sons of the Tiger, Shang Chi, and Iron Fist. Yes. And they yes. fought Fu Manchu, yes. and it was the most awesome fucking thing ever. <laughs> Those, and you think about the comics in that time, when you think about the way they were written, and the the whole camp of them, they were totally like some like black exploitation movie oh, kind of things. When you think about all the things, like with Luke Cage and and Luke Danny Cage Rand was and those pure black yes, totally. But I remember though having those comics and had buddies of mine have those comics and going like, but that guy was cool because he was like a black character. Look at this guy. He's like the, the only one of the dudes. Well, that's true. I was going to say, growing up, there weren't many black superheroes. No. It was the Falcon. And here's the weird thing. I mean, back in like the 70s, all the black superheroes had black in their name. There was yes. Black Lightning and yes. Black Goliath. <laughs> yes. Everybody, like, you don't know that I'm black already? I just can't be Goliath. It's like, How come on. Stuff it's is like, that? What the hell is that? It's like, please, let me just first preface this, guys. Black hero coming through. Look out, Justice League, I'm ringing the doorbell. Black Goli- you know, black lightning's here. Not regular lightning, it's black lightning. Oh, it's like, you know, it's like, lightning. Jesus Christ, it's like, my God. It's like, there you go. And, Such a different time. Yes, there you go, and black lightning's here. But to Marvel's credit, they actually salvaged the character of Luke Cage and made him amazing. They did, they, they did. They pulled him out from the black exploitation depths and made him one of the most substantive characters in their line. That's Bendis who did that, though. Yeah, I agree. That, that, that is, I mean... And so he definitely, you look at him and go like, he's a cool, cool ass character. And it's like funny thing, he but he fits a typical archetype of heroes that you go, they're boring. He's a brick, you know. He's invulnerable. He's super strong. It's like, what are you going to make out of that? But then again, you get his nuances of his being a street level guy, and you know, then his relationship with Jessica Jones and all those things that you go like, this is kind of cool. Well, the coolest thing about Luke Cage is one of the oldest concepts attached to him is the hero for hire, the idea that. Yeah, someone with these abilities, he's going to do right. it for cash. Exactly. It's like, like hey, why not? Mm-hmm. Why not? You know, you pay someone to mow your lawn. You pay someone to clean your house. Why not pay someone to take care of some of your issues? Though the, the crazy thing is, why would Luke even need that if Danny Rand is so rich? Well, you don't want to sponge off your friend. But Danny Rand's always willing to give up some I stuff. I know. But, I mean, if you were infinitely wealthy and Fitz said, come on, I, I need a place to live. <laughs> I mean, I... Then again, isn't that what friends are for? I guess. I mean, I guess Danny Rand's a real shitty friend. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah I mean, That's Kun it. Lun must have made him. I mean, he's the immortal Iron Fist, for all Christ's sake. And I love Iron Fist in the comic book, that is. All right, so we have a... <laughs> Thank you, because the TV show sucked. <laughs> um, I've delivered on the promise I made to myself and nerded out at the end of this interview. Yes. Thank you for that. No problem. Uh, we, we've covered everything. Uh, I think you're awesome. I really, this is Thank long you. overdue. I'm so glad we got to do yes, this. Yes, this is awesome. And, and I'm glad we got to eat beef sandwiches. And enough time has passed. Where do you stand on the return visit? Oh, we got to go back and get a second beef sandwich. Okay, I knew it. I, <laughs> I mean, what I'm, the hell? It's not, like, it settles in and you realize that my hunger has not been filled. I'm like Galactus. Old Galactus. You are. Not, not the one who's bringing life. I'm talking about old school Galactus. Daryl I Hungers. Hunger. Uh-huh. I hunger. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll be your Herald. I'll be your Terex the yes. Tamer. I'm going to get my purple suit on and walk around with a big purple helmet on and my purple apron. I am so glad we're both spoken for because neither of us would get laid after this No, God, no. no. God, no, no, no. Comic-Con. We'd have the Comic-Con smell on us already. Uh-huh. We're done. <laughs> All right. we're done Dude, thank you so much. Thank you, JBO. This is awesome, man. I appreciate it, man.